I have some new bags. So what these are, are two cheap and fairly generic electronics kits from Geekcrite, costing about $10 a piece. This one is a frequency counter used for measuring the frequencies incoming signals. And this one is the thing that goes with it, which is a signal generator. Today I am going to open these up, take a look and assemble them. So this is likely to be a long and rather boring workbench video. However, I have not opened these, so I will be doing this completely blind. So that will be interesting, I suppose. Anyway, let's start with which one looks more interesting. Let's start with the signal generator. I'm, so what have we got here? Anti-static bag. This is the case, which is acrylic. You're supposed to peel the paper off, which is why everything is brown. A PCB, a double-sided PCB, with rather small pads. That's interesting. And this should hopefully be the instructions. XR2206 function generator manual install. So we have a picture of the PCB, a parts list. Hmm. C1 electrolytic capacitor, 100 microfarad. The positive long feet. Yeah, this came from China. The welding installation considerations follow these steps. <laughs> the components are welding the front board from low to high principles, namely the first low welding components such as capacitor, resistor, diode, etc. Uh, okay. I believe what it's trying to tell me is that I work with the basic components first and I soldered the f oh, I put the components on this side and sold to the back. Ah, uh, I think. Wow. A welding IC socket, terminal blocks, finally power socket, adjustable potentiometer. The back with the diagonal cutting pliers to cut short the pins as far as possible. Okay, well, what have you got in the way of components? Pile of discrete stuff, some chips. This thing is based around a 2206 CP. I thought this was a pick actually, but it's not. With a socket, you've got some knobs. A few discrete components. Yeah, nothing particularly exotic there. And, ah, uh, yeah. On this side, we have the, the list of components and a annotated diagram telling you where they go. Uh, in fact, what we've got here is just a copy of the silk screen layer on the board. So everything is labeled on the board, which is nice. Uh, looking at the components, they're not all the same. These are three identical resistors. Right, that is in fact the same resistor. No, is it? No, it's not. Uh, this one is... Uh, brown, black, black, brown. This is brown, brown, black, brown. Okay. We've got capacitors, which are luckily all labeled. Yeah, good. Okay, this looks relatively straightforward. 
The components are welding the front board from low to high principles, namely the first low welding components such as capacitor, resistor, diode, etc. Okay, so let's have a look at these resistors. According to the schematic, we have adjustable resistors. These will be these B503, B104. Yeah, these are the knobs which you control the signal generator with, and they go roughly here. Let's not deal with them for a bit. Uh, we have a 1K resistor, three 5.1Ks and a 330. Ah, there's the other resistor. Uh, this is a uh, brown, black, black, gold. This is a brown, brown, black, black. Now I did used to know the resistor color code scheme, but I'm not going to bother. I'm going to use this component tester. It is a 1K resistor. So that is R1. That seems like a good place to start. Where is R1? Uh, R2, R5, R3, 6, 7, 8, R1. So this goes here. And how does that look? Not my worst joint. Excellent. Uh, the other loose resistor is the 330K, which is R4, which is this one. Double check. Come on. Yep, 330K. And that is R4. And that goes next to R1. R4 is here. I shall actually just move my T over here so that I don't move the soldering iron over it every time I take it out, otherwise I will get solder in my T, which will probably not improve the flavour. Okay, now we just need to do the other three resistors. So the backstory behind this, let me actually just double check the resistance is I was working on the flux engine and I was having some difficulty 5.1k, good, with the clock rate. And I was worried that the clock in the microcontroller board the flux engine is based around was wrong because it's based on an RC oscillator internally and they're not very good. It's supposed to lock onto the USB signal but I was worried it wasn't actually working. And I didn't have anything to actually measure a frequency with. So I ordered the frequency generator, it's this one, and sorry, frequency measurer. And, you know, I thought I might as well get the signal generator as well so that I had something to try it on. Plus it's a useful tool to have 
and they arrived the other day from a warehouse in the UK, so they was delivered remarkably quickly. So I don't actually need them anymore for the flux engine. The problem I was trying to debug turned out to be a one line, no, that's not very straight, a one line uh, bug in my code. I was just was measuring the time of a event incorrectly. It's interesting that this thing is a double-sided PCB, given that all the components go on one side. I just thought they'd saved some money there. The pads are... ouch, that's warm. The pads are small, but they do seem to solder reasonably well. That might be why it's double-sided, actually. The inside of all these holes are plated. They're vias. So it may be that they did that to make let them make use smaller pads, but still have the solder stick. So what I'm doing here is just attempting to fix that. That didn't really work very well. It'll do. Uh, it was R5 and R3. R6 is the last one. R6 is there. So this goes here. I am currently using a new microphone, which is a proper lapel microphone so I don't have the big studio mic hovering above me. This should make me easier to hear. We'll see, I'll have to see what it's like in editing. Uh, which is now clipped to my shirt. That was actually an advantage of being stuck working from home because I was able to... Uh, it's actually my work microphone so they are paying which is nice. Okay. That would be all the resistors. Uh, what's next? Capacitors. Let's go with the small ones. These are all different. We've got a 473, a 105, a 222, a 104 and a 101 non-polar capacitors. Okay, C2 is the 104. Which one was that? This one. C2 goes uh, here. Right, that's going to be a little bit awkward to solder. So if I push the legs out a bit. Yeah, that ain't going to go straight unless I can prop it up on something. Uh, got the minuscule vice. So I should be able to put the cap in like that. Do the vice up. Yep, yeah, that holds it in line. These are non-polar capacitors, so it doesn't matter which way around they go. Oops. Which is nice. Okay. C2, 104, double check it was, yes it was. Um, C4, 
5105. That's a 101. 105. This one. Uh, C5. There. Okay. Clamp it in the vise. Try and get it relatively straight. Okay. Just double check that. C5105. Yep. Next one is 473, which is C6. Okay, that's slightly more awkward. That's the one next to C5, which means I cannot use the vise to hold the component in place. So. This one, I'm just going to have to wing it. This is not going to be a very straight cab. a good joint. It should be okay. And I can't quite read the label, but it's something 73, which matches the label here, C6. C7 is 222. Two. Not that one. That one. 222. Two, two. And again, it's just going to have to be one. Oops. Well, that's still reasonably straight. So I have seen people with interesting PCB holders with two little clamps and a and a swivel. So you clamp the PCB on a mount and you can rotate it. I should get one of those. They look useful. And the last one is 101, which goes in C8, which is the top one. we got we've got the electrolytics which as the manual says uh, the positive long feet so what that's trying to tell me is that there's one long wire and one short wire and the long one is the positive side these do need to be placed the right way around the can also has a big white stripe with minus on it to indicate which is the negative side So what have we got here? This is a 10 microfarad, which means it's one of these, C3 or C4. C3 goes here. And it has not actually told me which is the positive or negative side. The, the indicator is striped. 
I believe that the striped side represents the negative. They should have printed a plus or a minus next to the relevant leg. So I believe this goes this way around. I should find a way to double check that. Oh uh, yeah. If you look at the This is where the power jack goes. And uh, this connector is connected to the... Wait a minute, what on earth is that doing? So, yeah, this is the ground plane, and it is connected via this hole to this track, which goes to the striped side. That's a very odd way to do it. I mean, there's no need for this to be an actual track. It's just a continuation of the ground plane. So, also I figured out why it's a double-sided board. They don't care about the components, they care about the tracks. Yeah, right, so the striped side is connected to the ground plane, which must mean the negative side. Uh, this one here is the positive connector from the power, which should be connected to that hole there. And there it is. So yes, striped means negative. Although it is possible it's a center negative jack and instead of having a ground plane there is in fact a positive voltage plane, but that would be really weird so I'm just going to pretend that's not going to happen. C3, 10 microfarad. This should be the other 10 microfarad cap. Yes. And this is C4, so this goes there. Short foot on the stripey side. Okay, not very straight. Uh, one other cap, which is C1, which is, should be 100 microfarad. Yes, it is. And that goes here. I don't know what the chip this thing has in it is. It, could be a fixed function signal generator. I was expecting a microprocessor, to be honest. Uh, the other one does have a pick in it. Right. So what have we got in the way of components? Uh, we've got power jack. We've got the, there should be two pots, that's a pot, 
That's a pot. That's a pot. I thought it was two pots and a switch. Nope, three adjustable resistance. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, so you can change the signal, you can change the waveform. And I thought one of the pots would do it, one of the knobs rather via a switch, but I believe that happens through these jumpers. Uh, yeah, these two jumpers, it says triangle and sign. I don't know what you, what you get if they're both connected, probably square wave. Let's do that power jack. This is a big component. Uh, let's use the vise for this one. Trying to keep it level is going to be interesting. Um, see, I really need three hands. I need one hand to hold the board, one hand for the soldering iron, and one hand for the solder. Let's try this. Actually, I'm going to cut these wires off because they're getting in the way. Because this is probably going to be the point where I discover that I made a mistake and I have to remove one of the components. And now the wires are too short to resolder them. Also, I have wires pinging all over the workbench. better. So we prop the solder up and okay good. Uh, it's not very well soldered on but it will now hold the component in place while I do the other joint and then I can go back and redo that first joint. These are big chunky bits of metal so it needs lots of heat. Quite a lot of solder. There's one. Mm. It's not straight. Uh, I believe it's too late to do anything about that now. I'm not going to be able to meaningfully desolder this. Never mind. Like so. 
All right. Uh, what's next? I think I need to do this. This is a jumper block. Why is this a jumper block? What is this for? It's obviously this component. It's not labeled. Two by five piece jumper cap. That, yeah, that is this, J3. J3, no? Uh, okay, this is the chip. Yes, this is a dedicated uh, signal generator chip. This must be the jumper block here, except this is labeled as four by two, but this is five by two. I can see it's connected to the four capacitors in the diagram. Five capacitors in the diagram. C7 and C8 are connected together. They're not. I do not think this circuit diagram matches the board. Oh well, I have no idea what this is for, but let's solder it on anyway. Uh, this is going to suffer from much the same problem as the uh, this connector, in that I have to somehow hold it in place while soldering. Um, I should have put this on before the um, DC jack, to be honest. So if I just do this, I should be able to get solder on one joint. Okay, so that will hold it in place. Is that upright? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's more upright than the capacitors. That's good enough. So now we do the others. This is old fashioned leaded solder. Oops. It's so much easier to work with than the modern lead-free solder. I have heard you cannot actually get this anymore in Switzerland, so mm, maybe I can order some black market stuff from Britain. Um, okay, what's next? We only actually have a few more components. We've got the the chip, or the chip socket, which goes in here, and they have supplied the cheapest and nastiest socket possible. But then I wasn't really expecting a rolled pin socket for a kit costing ten dollars. Yeah, we're going to have to use this trick. Oops. I bridged that. Okay, let's just solder on one of these over the other side to hold the thing in place and
It's better. Okay, good. Lots of magic smoke being released. Okay, uh, that wasn't so great, but it does seem to have worked. Right, um, yes, and I even managed to get the notch the right way around. So the chip will then push onto the, uh, the socket, but I won't do that now. Next one, these jumper, this jumper block. Same thing as before. Ow. That was warm. Uh, yeah, this is actually a little bit more awkward. I should have something to help somewhere. Right, tape. This is actually how you're supposed to do the other component. Because that will provide just enough force to let me solder on a joint and then the solder will hold the rest of it. Like so. And these will then control the thing by pushing on here. Somehow. Wait a minute. I think one of these goes on here and then you adjust something by moving the jumper. Because the Yes, uh, I think you adjust the capacitance by connecting which, by changing which capacitor is connected to this wire to the chip. Hmm, it's going to be interesting to play with and see what happens. Okay, this is the terminal block that is the output. That will go on here. So we need the tape again. Okay, it seems to have worked. 
And the only components we have now are the pots. Ha, wasn't on straight. They've made these holes quite wide. That's why the components like this aren't going on particularly straight, apart from general, you know, incompetence on my side. The board is not nearly as nasty as I was afraid it was going to be. Some of these kit boards can be really noxious. Uh, B104 is R8, which is this one. That wedges in fairly robustly. The These are anchoring pins and they are really big and it's going to take a lot of heat and solder to get those on. So let's just do the signal pins first. I think I'm also not going to fill the entire hole with solder. Oh no, that's not too bad. Okay. It does, but it does take quite a lot of solder to fill. Right. Course, it says. Fine is R7, which is B503, this one. And this one is B. This is also B503. Yes, there are two of those. Yeah, B104 is this one, and goes in course, and the other two are the same. All right. Bending the anchor a little to make it grip a bit more firmly. Still not very firm. Okay, that's one leg. So now we check to make sure it is straight and level before doing any of the others. Yeah, that's okay. Because you can adjust, after one joint you can adjust things, after two you can't. Okay. Whoops. All right. Whoa. Not doing well with the old clumsiness thing at the moment. And the other joint. The other one is this.
Okay. I believe this is the last component. Okay. So there we have the board. So let us install the chip. Make sure that the notch goes to the top to match the notch in the socket and more importantly, the notch in the label. Uh, straighten the legs. Now it plugs in there. Okay, so we're done with the soldering, so just turn the soldering off for a bit. And now we get to build the case. And this is a really common laser cut uh, acrylic case. I've just noticed it does actually have the controls etched into the top. So we need to peel the uh, paper off. What it will, the way it will work is the uh, these bits will fit into the notches and then the whole thing will bolt together. These acrylic cases are really common. I have a couple of Raspberry Pi cases the same way and the few bits of cheap test equipment. They're kind of ubiquitous. They're not brilliant, but they work well enough. Okay. Uh, yeah, this, looking at the case, the jumpers are labeled in frequency bands. So that will tell the signal generator roughly which frequency band you want, and then you use the fine and coarse knobs to control the uh, precise frequency. Which is reasonable enough. Be nice to have actual switches on it, but it costs $10. So this, yep, and the holes match up the PCB. So the bolts will go right through. You now I can't help noticing that I didn't seem to come with any kind of power connector. The other one came with a USB cable with a barrel connector on the end. So we've got two of these, these will go here. So, and 
these have notches out of them. One will be for the power connector and the other will be for the output. So this is probably the, yep. And this one, wow, exciting viewing, me peeling paper. Anyway, this is the last one. So, and this will probably go here. Yeah, that looks really shoddy actually, but that seems to be it. There are no actual instructions for this. Oh, there's a manual. Using the step, J1 jumper cap plug-in, Sintri Blue Terminals output sine wave. Note, J1, J2 can only insert one of. Yeah, that's reasonable enough. So there's no instructions for the case, but I'm guessing that the long bolts hold the, uh, the top and bottom together, while the short bolts go through here and hold the board onto the bottom plate. Uh, how many bolts do we have? Two, three, four, five? We've got four short ones. We've got five short ones and four long ones. Really? Five nuts? Oh well, we appear to be short-changed. But why do we have five of the short bolts, given that there are eight holes? I... You see, it doesn't even make sense that they gave us one of the, the short bolts instead of a nut. This is just wrong. Oh well. I think I've got some of these somewhere. Uh, that doesn't work. The space these nuts are too, uh, these bolts are too short to go through the board and the bottom plate. And it's not that I've cut the components off too short because it's the, it's the big lugs on the power connector and the, um, and the pots that are causing the problem. So, yeah, there's just too small. Hmm, I wonder, I, could, I might be able to chop some of these off.
I should add that the kit I bought came in a variety of different versions. And these things are completely ubiquitous, lots of people sell them. And quite obviously the case is produced by a different company than the board itself. So I'm not really surprised it doesn't fit very well. That's helped, but not enough. Uh, I think I might be able to get a bit more clearance by taking these off. this one. Yeah, this is not good. And also I want to put the bolts through this way around so the heads are on the bottom. That's not working. Uh, that one goes in. It is this tab here that's causing the problems. Okay, so we chew off some of some of that, and it yeah, that's better. I believe I am flexing the board rather to make this fit, but... Okay, that's terrible. I really don't want to have to do that. Uh, the, the board is distorted. It shouldn't be enough to matter, but that's just really bad. But let's try the top.
Ooh. Now this one won't go in because there's not enough clearance between the uh, here for the power socket. Oh, there we go. It just needs force and pushing. So this bit goes on here and plugs into, wait. Ah, uh -huh. uh -huh. that way up. Okay, and this goes together like this, and and these bolts don't go through because these holes here have these asterisk shaped inserts for some reason. Now the bolts go through, but not all the way. Ah, I know how this is supposed to work. Right, I've screwed that up. The bolts are supposed to go in like this, and then those asterisk shaped inserts are are supposed to take the thread, so you do the bolts up and they self-tap into the plastic. That is awful. That's a terrible, terrible way to do it. Unfortunately, I've now broken a lot of the plastic away, but there is enough left for them to sort of work. That's why they didn't give me uh, eight nuts because the nuts are supposed to go only on the bolts that hold the the board on wow well that is it assembled so we put one of these on here and one of these on here, and these go on here. Just turn all these down to zero. Like so. And, hmm. And the next thing to do is to get some power and hook it up to my scope and see where it works. So I'll go and set that up now. So here it is plugged into my archaic oscilloscope. Well, not plugged in yet, but I'll do that just now. Everything should be set up. Apologies for any screen glare on the oscilloscope. It's incredibly hard to film. So we hook this up to one of these wires and nothing happens. Interesting. Something should have happened. Do I have this set correctly? DC, channel one, 
Uh, it's not triggering. It's just fiddling with the oscilloscope controls. Uh, interesting. Set to sine waves. We should be getting a sine wave out of this. It's not doing anything. What was that? Ah, that's just mains hum from me touching the contact. Um, Okay, debug time. Do we have power? It's always the first thing to try. Why am I seeing 12 volts out of this? This is connected to USB. Five volts? Intriguing. Okay, well. What could I have done wrong, I wonder? Uh, Okay, well, let's take this thing apart again so I can get access to the board. This case is a pr pretty much a dead loss. I can't even just use bigger bolts because of the size of the side pieces. Okay, but anyway, we we have this. Stick these wires back in. These are just cut off bits of resistor leg. to power, connect this to ground, and see what there is to see. Right, well that's got power on it. That's 5 volts, you can see 2 volts per graduation. That's a thing. That's a thing. So the chip thinks it's doing something. Uh, let's stick it on one of these. I'm running out of hands. I need to yep, yeah, stick it on one of these and twiddle a few knobs. If I can get this to trigger. Now that looks like a fixed voltage to me. The manual does have <laughs> debugging steps. 
Pay attention to the direction of the IC. Insert that might damage the chip. Yes. Check the IC weather against, such as anti-please timely correction. Who knows what that means? Insert the power supply, power supply for 5.5 times 2.1 port, center positive, barrel negative. Yep. For 9 to 12 volt power supply voltage. Supply more than 12 volt, the power out. The output waveform is unstable. And here's the pinout of the chip. So we've got here is the output, and so pin eleven pins, yeah, pins eleven and two should contain the waveform. All right. Well, pin two is this one. There's nothing there. Uh, just checking the Okay, that's a zero. Mo, looking at all the numerous controls in the oscilloscope. I would expect the caps to be doing something. So let's hook that on here. There's a thing. But it seems to be a fixed. Uh, probably want the other side for that. No, that's a, that's a cap doing cap things. It is doing complete sod all. VCC is pin four to the chip. So let's just see if it's getting power. One, two, three, four, this one. Five volts. So the chip thinks it's doing something. Well, the chip is, thinks it's getting power. Is the chip fried? Do I have a dry joint somewhere? That could be extremely likely. Uh, somewhere there should be an oscillator. So fine and coarse here are the that's R7 and R8. 
that's these. So this voltage, R6, R7, and R8. Why are these connected in a row? The TR1 is pin 7. That should indicate the... That should control the frequency. So... I can see it going up and down as I twiddle the knob. Oops. So that's changing a little. Do I have any caps backwards? I'm just looking at the electrolytics here. Don't believe so. I mean, they all look the right way around. I double checked everything so that I don't believe that anything's connected up in the wrong place. It could be a dry joint, I suppose. Well, uh, just wondering how best to test this. We know it's getting power. So that is power, we know that works. Pin one is ground, we know that works. Let's try this one, we know that works. Uh, this one should be connected to pin two. Uh, sorry, this one should be connected to pin two, yep. Uh, this middle one is connected to one end of R1, which is here, yep. The other end of R1 is connected to power, which you know is on pin 4, yep. This should also be connected to sync O, which is pin 11, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yep. Uh, let's put this here so that it shows up on camera. Uh, 8, 9, 10. Pin 10 should be connected to one end of C3. It'll give me this one. That one, bit three is, yep. The other end of C3 is connected to ground. Well, yeah, it's on the ground plane. Uh, This one is ground. Yep. Uh, you've got a potential divider here with R2 on it. This is the amplitude. This is R2. So, 
one end, the middle of R2 should be connected to pin 3. Yep. Uh, and, yep. And the other end is the potential divider. I don't see anything particularly obviously wrong. Bridge joints? Mm. No. That doesn't look so hot, but I beat that one out and I know it works. So, is it the chip? Is it su su subject to, has it been static fried? So the amplitude went into pin three, so connect that to ground. So on the scope we see something. Ooh, it doesn't move very far, does it? Expect more than that. I wonder if I put the pots on the right in the right place. What do we get as to one end of the potential divider? So this is one end of the 50k pot. That's about two and a bit volts. I think I'm on this end actually. Hmm. Yeah, that's this one. That is two and a bit volts. 5.1K, 5.1K, so that should be uh, 2.5 volts and halfway in between. So yeah, that seems fine. Um, I can see that the the wiper and one end of the pot are connected together, which is just the same as the circuit diagram. So let's just try measuring the overall resistance between the two ends of that pot. That's three mega ohms. That's at one end. So let's turn it all the way around to the other. Four mega ohms. Interesting.
Why not the other pots? Four meg. Four meg. Let's turn them all the way that way. Four meg. Four meg. Okay, let's turn them all the way the other way. I don't really understand what's going on there. These pots seem to be producing a completely ridiculous values. So we've got 250Ks and 100K. It should be reading a much lower resistance than what the meter is showing. So that's actually working. This should show. Uh, that should be registering zero. Okay, yeah, um, this switch wasn't all the way in the right position. Let's do that one again, shall we? Right. This is more what I expect. So the pot is in all, in all the way in one direction, which means no resistance. Yeah. Turn them all the way in the other direction. One hundred K, fifty K, fifty K. So this is the hundred K, which is C one. No, it's not fifty K, which is R seven. R8 is 100k, this one. Okay, right, I got the pots in the right place. So the scope is in fact showing no activity from the chip at all. The Various voltages are doing their thing. So C3 looks like it should be some kind of oscillator. There's a capacitor on it. But then all this stuff should as well. Let's try pin six. One, two, three, four, five, six, this one. So that's just mains noise. Nope, nothing.
I am. Uh, let's try that again with it plugged in. That will always help. Right. OK, that is showing voltage now. But no activity. Let's pull the jumper. No. No. Uh, I'm actually a little bit suspicious of the oscilloscope, so this is the test pack, the test point, which produces a square wave. So, yep, okay, that's all working. That's four volts, dead on. So I would expect to be seeing something from the capacitor bank, because I'd expect to see the capacitors charge up and discharge as they do something. So, okay, it was suspicious of the jumper. This says that uh, one side of the jumper is connected to pin five, which is TC one. So. One, two, three, four, five. Yep. Well, the other end is connected to TC2 via the capacitor, but there's pin six. Yep. It is looking very suspiciously as if there may be something wrong with the chip. I mean, I can't see anything else it could be. It could be static fried. It could just not be a real chip. Uh, I will test that. So what we do is we take some IPA and a cotton bud and we wipe the top of the chip. I might actually need acetone for this, I think. So if it's a fake chip, then frequently it will you'll get black. And it's not, it's completely clean. Yeah, I would be really surprised if that was fake, but yeah, and the writing remains nice and sharp. Yes, I am stuffed. I have no idea what could be wrong with this. I am out of ideas. I will have to go... Hmm. I have to go and do some uh, online research and see what could be wrong. Well, so problem solved. It turns out that, in fact, after doing a bit of research online, the device does not run at five volts. The manual is wrong, or at least incomprehensible. 
Uh, insert the power supply, power supply for 5.5 times 2.1 port. Uh, yeah, so I have my bench power supply producing 8 volts. And it actually works a bit more than 9, so let's stick this up to about 9.5. And, and here we have a sine wave, or at least what it thinks is a sine wave. It's not really a very good waveform. If I change this to triangle, you can see it's clipped, but I can turn the amplitude down and I get a reasonable triangle wave. This is at the lowest, second lowest frequency. So let's put this up to about here. And this is not bad. You can adjust the frequency, fine and coarse. They are both actually about the same amount. Uh, let's put this back to sine, see how that works. Yeah, it's a little better. And you notice that we're only getting about plus or minus one volt. Oh, and if I set this to DC, uh, the, the everything is floating at about plus five volts. But in most situations, you're going to be wanting a uh, you're going to be decoupling it anyway. Uh, it would actually be very easy to stick a capacitor in to decouple the supply. Uh, okay, let's undo this and let's have a look at square wave. It appears the way the thing works is it actually generates the square wave and uh, then generates the sine or sawtooth wave from that. Interesting about the square wave is that the amplitude pot does nothing but you can still adjust the frequency. Uh, it's okay, it's got nice sharp ups and downs. Uh, let's try it at really high frequency, the highest it will go. And uh, That hasn't actually gone in the hole. Uh, okay, and let's crank up the time base. Yeah, yeah. Um, two microseconds per division is four, that's just eight microseconds per oscillation, and I can't do that math in my head, but that will give you an idea as to what the frequency is. Uh, let's try the sine wave. That's a decent sine wave. The, however, the sawtooth is extremely not decent. But you have to again reduce the amplitude. I have a bit of a feeling that the way it does the sine wave is to just smooth the sawtooth. But yeah, the shape's okay. Hook it up to a speaker and you'd get like nasty noises. Frequency goes up, voltage goes down. But this is a really high frequency. So yeah, it does seem to work. Not running at five volts is slightly more interesting than I was expecting. Uh, also, uh, I figured out the case. I mean, yes, I have broken the uh, the mount, but uh, it turns out that uh, the bolts for the PCB, it actually goes together like this. Uh, so they don't go through the bottom acrylic layer. All it does is these bolts together and then where did I actually put the... there it is. And then this sits like this. All the bolts are for is for 
uh, is to uh, to keep it in place. So we then put these in. And that's the wrong way around. That one goes in there. That one goes there. And everything fits together rather better. Like so. Some of these bolts would would still do up. Come on, here we go. is not one of them unfortunately um, I can bodge this back together by simply sticking some glue in the bolt holes that will give the thread something to stick on something to attach to yeah anyway that fits together like this the uh, and then the top lid, the, the PCB is then held fairly rigidly in place just by the geometry of the thing. And the pots go on over the top. Like. So. And there we have, <laughs> yeah, those, those bolts have not worked. And there we have a perfectly functional function generator with hair in it. Well, that took rather more debugging than I was expecting. Luckily, it turned out to be something so trivially simple. So I'm not going to build the other one now. I think I'm going to do that as a separate video because I need to go out and get some exercise. I'm stuck in the house all day. Anyway, general comments on the thing. The electronics are fine. The case is poor. The instructions are not good. Uh, the quality of the actual waveform you get out is exactly what you would expect for something costing $10. I can think of a few improvements to make, such as ripping out these caps and putting in a proper variable capacitor. Uh, you know, actual switches rather than jumpers, but uh, yeah, on the whole, it seems to work. Which is just what I wanted. So, there you go. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments.